Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming here tonight. And, uh, and actually to thank everyone for being so engaged in this process as we've gone over the last few months. Uh, as I was just speaking to somebody on the way here, I think or to, in the building tonight, I think it's, we've seen a greater involvement than we've seen in a long time. And I hope that as we uh, move forward, we can continue this energy. And some of the focus of why we're doing this series of meetings right now, uh, we're going to do tonight, and then again Thursday night will be the same, pr the same presentation that we're going to be doing tonight. And then uh, the, 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 the last week of the season, we're going to be doing uh, some more, more public input and visioning process. And, and our purpose is to try to get uh, grass people while they're here before people start to uh, disperse for the season. Um, but again, this process will continue in, in with, with, with great energy throughout the summer and, and, and into the early fall for sure, and then even further into that. You know, and, and the reason that I think that everybody's here is because we love Alta. Uh, we live here, we work here, we depend on it for this community, for our, our lifestyle, our livelihood, and, and pretty much uh, the, the love that we have here for Alta. And a lot of us have given our lives to this place. And I think it's important that, that we all step forward and make sure that we know what everybody wants because, because I think the, the focus is, is that we want to make sure that we protect and see Alta, it, whether it stays the same or changes in, in a manner that, that we all want to see happen because it is such an important, um, it is an important aspect to our lives. You know, the Mountain Accord has, has created a really powerful vision of, of what could happen across this whole region. And I think that the issue that we have to face is, is that how do those major changes across the region, how do they specifically affect us here in the town of the Al of Alta? You know, one of the, uh, you know, as I've always said, you know, one of the major things that I was involved with in the beginning was is that, uh, it, it was about transportation, but as time, time has moved on, we, we can't look at transportation improvements without looking at how it affects the environment, the economy, and recreational interests. So I think that the, the blueprint is heading us in the right direction, but uh, there, it does still raise a lot of questions about what can actually specifically happen here in the town of Alta. So the purpose of why we're here tonight and then again on Thursday is to explain what the blueprint really is, to provide in information about certain aspects of the blueprint, and to get serious about articulating our vision for the town of Alta. Because the blueprint is just a vision. For the, and, and Alta is, is part of the region that this whole blueprint will affect. And the most important thing for us to now is to get an understanding what the blueprint is, how it, how it works with us, and how we want to put the ideas and concepts from the blueprint into our future planning and how we want to see Alta look into the, in, into the, you know, whether it's the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, maybe in the next century. So with that, I'll uh, introduce Meg Ryan. She's going to be helping us as a facilitator and, and helping us as we go through this process in the next while. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Well, that was a, a great summary. Maybe I don't need to say anything, but um, you're probably wondering who am I? Well, I'm Meg Ryan, <laughs> and I'm a Park City resident. I uh, have lived up there for about 25 years, so a bit of an um, outsider to you, and that's why I'm here to help just facilitate and run through this meeting tonight. So um, we're going to talk, um, as the Mayor said, about Mountain Accord. Um, we have Jeff. You have an agenda. Um, that was at the back, but basically we're going to have Jeff talk um, from Mountain Accord about that vision and a little bit about the timeline. You can see we have a timeline for Mountain Accord and uh, for Alta's general plan update, which Chris will be talking about later tonight. Um, but really, we're here to, the uh, town wanted to give you information and start this, as the mayor said. So after um, we hear from Jeff, we're going to hear uh, again from uh, Lainey with Mountain Accord, and then from uh, Dave from the Forest Service, and Anno um, from the ski area, and then the mayor again. And then Chris is going to talk a little bit about the Planning Commission role and how you could be involved in public input um, throughout this process. And as the mayor said, this is really the kickstart. This is the start, not the end. 
Um, and we also have public comment cards at the end. We're going to have some um, questions at the end, but we also have workshops coming up, which will be much more intimate and a chance for you to ask more questions, uh, give more comment. Um, as Chris will talk about, they also set up a social media website for those of you that like to go online. You can, uh, at your heart's delight, in your pajamas, make comments on the internet and, uh, and have some dialogue there. So really the town's trying to do a multi-pronged approach to get your input and get your comments and thoughts. So with that, I will turn it over to Jeff. And I know this seems awkward, but if you can <laughs> talk into that. We are videotaping this, so uh, that's why we're doing that. Thank OK. You. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, as Meg said, Mountain Accord, give you an overview of it, uh, some of the key features of the blueprint, and uh, what's proposed in it, and try and put some relevance to uh, the town of Alta, to what's proposed in that blueprint especially in the context of uh, what the town of Alta, what you all are going to be going through with the general plan update that Chris is going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, just so I know what the level of, of awareness is right now for Mountain Accord, how many of you have attended at least one Mountain Accord meeting and heard a presentation about it? How many of you have attended four or more? Wow, and you're still smiling. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll kind of do this at a uh, sort of middle of the road. If there are any questions, though, we'll have a chance for Q&A at the end. If I go through, through something too fast, let me know, but I'll try to not dwell on this too much, so just kind of bring up the highlights that are most relevant. So as uh, a lot of you have probably heard, what was the reason for Mountain Accord in the first place? Well, what brought us together? Why, why are we even doing Mountain Accord? And this map is our attempt to sort of put that in a graphical format. This circle in the middle is the central Wasatch, where you see those yellow lines. Those yellow lines are the current transportation corridors that go up into the central Wasatch. The one at the top is I-80, uh, Parley's. Those red arrows are signifying urbanizing, urban and urbanizing pressure. And you know what we've, the traditional pattern of urbanization in the area has been, you know, starting here and the valley, right? This orange corridor the I-15 corridor. That's where traditionally a lot of the urban development has been, the population growth and the pressure, and all those people are putting pressure on the central Wasatch, you know, for water needs, for recreation needs, economic purposes, a variety of, of, of intents puts pressure on there. The back has been uh, there for quite some time too, but hasn't, hasn't been a lot of population there. And so there's been some pressure on the central Wasatch, but not a lot. It hasn't really been urbanizing, hasn't grown all that fast. Now we're seeing a lot of fast growth. It's projected to double in population, Wasatch County and Summit County. So it's still not a huge population, but double what it is today by 2025, by the year 2040, which is just you know, 25 years from now, which isn't all that far from a planning isn't that all that far in the future from a planning perspective? So it's the various pressures of growth, pressures of, of a developing economy, uh, recreation pressures, water needs, environmental needs, these kinds of things, these kinds of pressures are what really motivated Mountain Accord. Let's take all of these different um, uh, stresses that are, gonna on, uh, that are on the central Wasatch and what we're projecting that more are going to be coming the various projects that have been proposed in the area, and let's put them all into one you know, big venue, and let's figure them out all out together. Let's not do it piecemeal. Let's figure them out as one cohesive, comprehensive, integrated solution for, uh, for the long term. So it's, you know, some of those, the way we see it manifested is congestion, obviously. Up here there's a lot of congestion, we see parking issues, uh, we see impacts from more and more people wanting to recreate. Uh, we see impacts, potential impacts from ski areas, you know, wanting to expand, wanting to develop to meet, you know, their economic challenges and their economic goals. At the same time, we see backcountry skiers wanting to protect the land that they've got, you know, the, where they're currently skiing. So there's a lot of, there's private landowners that want to develop, there's, you know, water, uh, those agencies and people with a, a mission for, to protect our water source. And so we just see conflicts in all these areas. Mountain Accord is trying to bring all those together and, and help find solutions. 
So that's the, this is essentially the blueprint. This is kind of a summary of the blueprint. It's got economic elements, transportation elements, environmental preservation, water protection, and recreation. And I'll go through each of those pieces. There's the land and open space protection part of it. And actually, L Laney's going to talk more about this in detail, so I'll just be real brief about it. It involves you know, proposals for some additional protection on federal lands, different designations that would uh, change some of the uses that are allowed there and provide additional protections. It also invo involves some land exchanges and other issues that directly affect and are involved, uh, involved the town of Alta. Like I said, Laney will talk about more, that in more detail later. Uh, recreation trail network. It proposes to create more trails. Some of these would be connections that don't cur that currently exist to allow more of a uh, kind of a regional travel on trails. Some are, are less regional and more about providing more opportunities since there's more people wanting to use the trails. If we have more capacity, more, trail op more trails out there, there's less crowding. Uh, it, there, another part of it too is helping to determine which trails and which areas can really accommodate the growing pressure, partly from growing population, just locally, residents, but also visitors. You know, that part of this too is looking at attracting additional visitors and accommodating additional visitors that may come whether we try to attract them or not. So the idea is to look at the, where, what are the high use, what are the areas that can accommodate high recreation use? Like Snowbird and Alta have been identified as one of the areas that can accommodate uh, higher use. And there are other areas that are, are seen as, well, that they, they're more environmentally sensitive or you know, they're more focused on a recreational experience that requires solitude, some of the wilderness. How, what should we do? How do we accommodate that? What, kind of, what should the Forest Service do? And I know the Forest Service is looking at these issues right now. What should the town of Alta do? What should all of our you know, stakeholders and interest groups and agencies involved in this, how do we meet these goals? How do we preserve the recreation opportunities that we like, you know, and that we hold so dear, but at the same time accommodate the additional people and the additional population growth. So that's a big part of the recreation. Uh, economic recreation centers are here too. Um, it proposes that the additional development that's coming with the additional population growth and, and businesses be focused on specific nodes, nodes of development, and that those for the most part be in the valley. They be in certain places in the back, in certain places of the valley. And then a lot of this comes from regional planning work that's been done outside Mountain Accord. We adopted those as part of Mountain Accord. Wasatch Front Regional Council has done some of this, led some of this. MAG you know, the, has done some as well. We adopted that as part of, part of Mountain Accord and says, yes, those are the right places to focus economic development. And, and a limited amount in the, in the mountains as well, at the ski areas, accommodating some additional development there too. Then there's the transit connections. And these transit connections uh, are intended in part to help support and promote the idea of nodal development, concentrating the development in the valley and in the back in areas where the, it can be accommodated. And it looks at uh, transit connections in these different corridors. It proposes uh, a variety of issues or a variety of different options that are going to be studied more in an EIS. And I'll just talk about this part in particular. So what, it, what the blueprint proposes for the, uh, a corridor from Sandy, here on the left, moving up Little Cottonwood Canyon uh, to Alta, over to Big Cottonwood Canyon and back to Park City and then out to two destinations in Park City, is it proposes to do an environmental impact statement. We don't have, we don't, we have some travel demand modeling, we have some analysis that we've done to know that some of the modes that we're proposing to look at have promise, but we don't have enough design yet, we don't have enough environmental information, we don't have enough, you know, socioeconomic information to really understand what are the impacts of all the modes that are being proposed. What are the costs? What, are the, what specifically are the benefits? Not just the construction costs, but also long-term maintenance operation costs. How might they affect community character? How do we want to shape these alternatives to really fit the needs of, like, the town of Alta that you would you know, establish through your vision and your general plan? What's the right transportation solution? What's the right land exchange, exchange uh, solution to help support those visions and those goals? That's part of what the EIS is proposed to do is to look at that. So this is what the blueprint says about transportation in this corridor, is we should look at these modes. We should study these in detail. Light rail, bus rapid transit, 
an enhanced bus uh, transportation system management alternative, which is essentially do very little in the way of new construction. What's the best we can do using the existing transportation infrastructure that we've got? How best can we, how, what's the best thing we can do to serve the needs, the future needs based on that? And then it would look at various alignments. The EIS would look at an alignment that is just, like I said, within the existing roadway parameters. What's the best we can do to not, ex if we don't add any additional right of way? It would also look at alignments adjacent to the road for light rail or bus rapid transit, additional right of way that's adjacent to the existing road. And then it would look at new alignments. And you know, new alignments are going to be, you know, each of those is going to have its trade offs. Well, let's, let's really put them on a map. Let's really understand what they are so we really know what the trade offs, the impacts are. Can you see okay there? And uh, then it would also look at different options for ending it. You know, at where is the right endpoint. And so we would study, well, what would, what would it mean, the impacts, benefits, and costs if we ran light rail from the valley up to the town of Alta and it ended there. It didn't go any further. Or bus rapid transit ended there, didn't go any further. And what's the difference between that and then tunneling across to Solitude and Brighton and ending there? What's that marginal difference in impacts uh, to you know, all areas of the environment? natural environment, uh, natural, social, et cetera. And then the third option would be, what if it continues on to Park City in the back and out to Kimball Junction and Quinns Junction? What does that mean from an impact, benefits, and cost standpoint? So the EIS would look at all those options, and it would look at no build too. Study them, understand them in a lot more detail before a decision made is, before a decision made is, is made on what mode, what alignment, what endpoints things like that. Or it, should it be no build? So just real briefly, why even look at light rail? Uh, well, one of the reasons is it would have the fastest travel time. That's one of the reasons it's in there. It also has all weather reliability. It can, it's not slowed down by hardly any weather. There are certain, you know, extreme cases where you would have to clear the tracks and things like that. For the, but for the most part, it's, it's not very affected by the weather. Um, it has high land use benefits in the valley. It helps a, it when you connect a, you know, these economic nodes and development nodes in the valley, as well as back in Park City, with high capacity light rail, tran high capacity transit, BRT or light rail, and you have land use plans and codes that help reinforce, here's where we want the density to be, here's where we want to preserve open space. You, you connect uh, the homes and businesses and recreation destinations like in, what we have in the mountains, with a, with a high capacity convenient transit system, you get the, you know, it shapes your development patterns. And that, that's one of the goals of light rail. Uh, it can also go up steep grades, steeper grades than um, bus rapid transit or buses can. Downside, typically requires additional right of way. It can share the road, but you get a completely different performance if it's sharing uh, with, you know, with cars. This would probably really need to be in its own right-of-way. So that's one of the downsides we'd have to look at. What is the impact of that additional right-of-way? And capital costs, it's pretty costly. The initial investment is pretty high. Now the operation costs are generally lower than with a bus, but the initial investment is higher. Bus rapid transit is sometimes called light rail on tires because the idea is it's in its own guideway. It ha has its own exclusive guideway. It's not slowed down by traffic congestion. You know, if there's a slow shuttle bus or a car that's having trouble getting up in the snow or something like that, BRT and light rail are in its own guideway. It just whizzes past and, you know, without being slowed by things like that. And it operates similar to light rail. Um, like it says here, faster and more reliable than a local bus because it's in its own guideway. Uh, it has some land use benefits. It can have some land use benefits down in the valley to help, you know, reduce auto use as well. Uh, it's a pretty attractive approach to transit, so it's got broader benefits for air quality and land use. Uh, partial weather re reliability, a little better than a uh, bus would be on a on shared right-of-way with cars. It also has some of the downsides of light rail, requires additional right-of-way, more expensive because it has its own right-of-way, and one downside compared to light rail is it's affected by weather. Then the other th options we'd look at are, like I said, using the existing roadway. How can we improve the bus service? Uh, what kinds of incentives and disincentives can we, what kind of incentives can we provide to people to use transit? 
and disincentives to cars, so we can get people out of their cars and onto transit. What are all, all the options we can, you know, all the measures we can throw at that to see, you know, how best can we make that work? Like one of the things that's been talked about, we've heard people a lot say, what about the, um, the Zion model? Why can't we look at something like that? Have very frequent shuttle bus service up the canyons and prohibit cars. And early on, we had, you know, some pretty adamant uh, opponents to that kind of thing. And it, that's, I mean, that would be a huge decision to make. You can't just suddenly say, okay, we're not going to allow any cars. That has impacts on a lot of people. So the appropriate way to really, the appropriate venue for really evaluating that is the EIS. So we can really get out there on the table. What are the benefits? What are the impacts? How does everybody feel about that? Are there ways to mitigate the impacts? How do we, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, so we'll look at, the proposal is to look at a wide variety of options for TSM. Some of the comments we've received so far, and you know, maybe you, maybe some of the comments are from you, they probably are, is there's only one thing that people are almost unanimous on, and that is, yes, yeah, something needs to be done. There is no public consensus on what that should be. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's, uh, that's a good place to be for starting an EIS. I think there's a lot of concerns about some of the modes that have been proposed. Uh, there's uh, proponents for every mode. There's detractors from every mode. And there's a lot of people who said, we need more information. We can't make a decision with the information we've got now. And we completely agree. We can't make a good informed decision. That is the whole intent of the environmental impact statement is let's get that detailed information out there so we really can make a a good decision, an informed decision. So some of the <clears throat> potential blueprint benefits, um, you know, you could, it could, some of the alternatives could result in less traffic and less parking demand in the canyons. You know, I don't know if Anno's interested in shrinking his parking lot, but, you know, if we could be effective enough at really getting people on transit and out of their cars, that might be a possibility. That might be a possibility to repurpose some, some parking. It has happened in some areas where you've actually been able to reduce parking supply if you pro provide really good and efficient transit service. Mostly it's done in downtown areas to try and discourage all the cars and try and encourage people to walk or bike or use transit. Uh, community area amenities in Alta. Well, that, that's on the table. Partly that's the land exchange proposal that's in the blueprint, and partly that's, you know, could be enhanced or or somehow supported by uh, some of the transportation options that are in the blueprint as well. Creating a space that is a maybe community gathering area, or sort of a community center, as well as a, um, uh, providing those amenities for, for the community itself. Trails and preservation, you know, that's some of the proposals I talked about. Talked about helps, <coughs> helps shape the way we grow, especially in the valley, but also could have an influence up here. And that's something we really under want to understand. How would those investments, how would those land swaps shape what happens in Alta uh, in the future? Uh, evacuation route. Some people have said, you know, this is a dead end canyon. If the road is closed, we have no way out. Uh, there's only one option really in the blueprint that would provide a, a potential evacuation option, and that's if there was a, you know, some connection over to Big Cottonwood Canyon. And I don't, I don't have a good handle from the comments we've received how important that is to people. When we had the system group meetings last year, a lot of, that got brought up a lot. But I, you know, I don't know that I've seen a lot of comments. Claire, have you seen a lot of comments on that evacuation route? That's an important thing to people or not? More in Big Cottonwood. Yeah, it seems to be more of a Big Cottonwood Canyon concern. And that would, I mean, a tunnel connection would obviously provide an evacuation for op option for them as well over to Little Cottonwood. Uh, the other option, the other b blueprint here is too, let's, a full vetting of this idea of a connection. So we aren't trying to, we aren't, no one's being forced to make a decision about a connection or no connection with the information we have today, you know, which is only partial, it's only preliminary. It would be a full vetting of that, full understanding of what we're getting and what we're not getting with, with connecting or not connecting. Potential blueprint impacts. There would be, with some of these options, any of the build options, there'd be construction impacts. You know, all that goes along with that. There's noise that goes along with that. If there's tunneling, there'd be, you know, rock removal. 
There'd be you know, trucks hauling materials. That would be one of the impacts we would look at in the EIS. Uh, could be more expensive. You know, most of the alternatives talk about, well, if we really want to have less cars coming up the canyon and less parking demand, that means providing some disincentives to drive. And that probably means you know, one of those, the big disincentives is cost. So that could be an impact that we want to look at is what impacts to driving a car. Uh, it could be, it, some of these op options could result in more people. You know, we know that there's going to be more people based on population projection, but also some of the options that are being considered could just, could attract more people themselves, right? And what's, how does that going to impact character? How does that impact trails? You know, it's, it, uh, the footprint of those people, if they don't bring a car, their overall footprint could be less of any given individual. Uh, and maybe that means the total footprint is less, but that's something we want to understand. You know, what, what really does that mean? Uh, and then potential changes to Alta character. And we know there's mixed feelings. Some people say, yeah, we've, we've, we want to see some enhancement of certain elements of the character, and maybe some elements of the character maybe we could go away, but there's certain, certain aspects of the, of the character we definitely don't want to change, or there's certain ways we could change we don't want to. So that's, you know, that's another thing we want to understand in, in detail. And that's where your, the general plan update process that Meg was talking about and Chris is going to talk about will be really important. What does, what does Alta see for their future? What do, they, what do they want? And then we'll look at how does that fit with Mountain Accord. So the EIS would answer questions like this. Compare the modes. It would compare connections. It would compare you know, all the proposed actions. And it would look at impacts and benefits to... Like I said, watershed, water quality, visual, how might it change you know, visual and aesthetics? How could it change visitation and tourism, uh, incomes and revenues? Uh, how could it change congestion, land use, and so on? And then it would also look at, I think I mentioned before, what are the capital costs of each alternative? What are the operation and maintenance costs of each alternative? And what's the funding? That's the other thing that we, the EIS would help flesh out is, or be, in parallel with the EIS is how do these things get funded? How would we fund each option? And it's not, I know there's a lot of concern. We've had questions at a number of meetings of, well, tell us how you're gonna fund this. We know like some of these rail options are really expensive and tunnels are expensive to build. How are you gonna fund it? We have, there are ideas. We had a lot of ideas on paper and we've talked with federal agencies about potential funding, but we don't, we don't yet know at this point how all those would be funded. That would be part of the EIS process. And that is not unusual at all at this phase of, uh, of a project, especially a project of this potential size, to not yet know at this point when it will be, how it will be funded. I've, I've worked on uh, maybe a half dozen of projects of about this magnitude, and only one of them knew at this point in the process how it was going to be funded. And that was because the state legislature voted right up front, we're going to fund it entirely. All the others didn't, none of the others knew at this point how it was going to be funded. So that's not to worry that that's not identified yet. That would be part of the EIS process. So this is just the Mountain Accord timeline. And I think Chris will talk a little bit more about the general plan update timeline and how that fits. Uh, we've extended the public comment period on the blueprint. It was originally ending on March 16th, I believe. And we've extended it now to May 1st. Um, so if you have more comments you want to submit, please submit them before then. We think the executive board then is going to be uh, making a decision on a blueprint, and it could very well be a refined blueprint, probably will be, make some revisions to it based on the input that we received so far and that we'll receive before then, and then adopt it in June or possibly July. And between now and then, we want to have more input. Meetings like this, I mean, Altas is, is unique in that you know, you are looking towards a, a general plan update, but we, there's five or six other, four or five or six other communities. We're also trying to have more outreach to and really make sure they understand what the blueprint is proposing and make sure we understand what their concerns are and if they want any refinements to it, we understand what those are. Uh, so just to clarify, Mountain Accord is not a jurisdiction or an agency in and of itself. It is voluntary participation by all the agencies that are, are there, that are on the executive board. Uh, it has no authority in and of itself to 
really make any binding decisions. When there's a blueprint, it won't be a legally binding decision. That will, legally binding decisions will come with, at the end of the EIS, there's a record of decision, then that's, you know, with the federal agencies are clarifying it and declaring, here's our decision related to these, these proposals. Um, there will be uh, congressional actions potentially. Those will be binding decisions. There will be each local jurisdiction, town of Alta, for example, will make a decision. They'll make a decision about what, what do they want? How do they feel about Mountain Accord? Do they want to accommodate it or not? Or if they want to accommodate it, how? How does it fit within their, their vision and their general plan? And yeah, so it's really, it's up to you uh, as the you know, citizens of each of these jurisdictions to really weigh in and let your elected officials know, uh, I need more information or here's my input on it, uh, here's my opinion on things. Um, that's, that's what it's all about. And then next is the land exchange that Lainey's going to talk about. Thank you, Jeff. So yeah, Lainey's going to um, talk about a discrete portion of that, and then we'll also have uh, the ski area and the, uh, the Forest Service and then the mayor again. Great. So, hi. I think I know a lot of you in the room, and I just turned this thing off, so what do I do? How do I get it back on? Do I press some button here? Ah, there we go. Okay. So, I just, uh, just want to briefly talk about the lands package and what, what has been proposed and what the path forward is uh, on the lands package, and then we'll hear from um, the Forest Service and... Um, and Anno. So basically, in order to accomplish the preservation component that we outlined right here, right here, the, the basic concept here is that we want to see, we want to include protections in the future that would limit development in the mountains generally speaking. The light green on the left is existing wilderness on Forest Service lands, and that's pretty much protected. It takes an act of Congress to change it. It's, uh, Dave can clarify, I think it's the highest level of protection out there. Yes. He, he went like this. Okay, so that's the highest level of protection. So basically, you know, we, we talked to the economic community. We had the ski resorts involved. We had the tourism community involved. We had real estate people involved. We had residents, environmental community, recreation community. And there was a theme there from everybody. And the theme was don't kill the golden goose. That is the golden goose. Um, let's not overdevelop it. Let's preserve it. And, um, and let's pair that up with other components, with, with which uh, Jeff talked about. So there were um, two ways, specific ways, that we proposed to uh, protect the area in green. One way is through additional federal protection, so expanded wilderness or a national recreation area or a national conservation area, something that ensures that 20, 30, 40 years from now, we've glued in place what we have today, okay? The second method that we identified for preservation is uh, land, land trades or land ownership adjustments with our major landholders, the ski resorts. So we entered into a negotiation with the resorts, and this is a preliminary outcome from that. So we, we spent, I don't know, two, three months on the negotiation, and then we said, it's pencils down, let's tell the public what we've done. And that's where we are. Nothing has been decided on this. Uh, this is out for public input. So the areas in blue are areas that one of the four Cottonwood Canyon ski resorts own that they would put into public preservation. And the orange areas at the base of the, um, does this thing have a pointer? Oh, look, it does. The orange areas right there, right there, right there, and right there are lands that the ski resorts would receive that are currently now for service lands that would go into their ownership. Of those four areas, three of them would not receive any additional water or development rights. It would simply reduce the bureaucracy because they would own the land underneath the buildings at the base of the resort. This is something the Forest Service has requested, the ski resorts have requested, and it's just 
to facilitate less bureaucracy. <laughs> it's tough if you own a, a lodge and it's own, and the land underneath it is owned by the Forest Service. So both parties said, let's clean that up, get the upper watershed lands into, into Forest Service ownership, base of the resorts into resort ownership. So for three of those, there's no additional development proposed and there's already some development already allowed that could be allowed at Snowbird, something in the 2,000 units area that was uh, approved or um, on the books planned before Mountain Accords started. Nothing changed with that. Brighton and Solitude have something under 200 units, very minor. Mountain Accords not changing any of that. The only one that changed was the town of Alta, and in the negotiations, it was identified what about 100, un 100 additional units. So that's out there as a part of the um, as a part of the Cottonwood scenario, and it's out for public comment. Um, here's a blow up of the area specifically. So the land on Mount Superior and Flagstaff would go into public ownership, and the the land at the base of Alta there would go into Alta ownership. Grizzly Gulch is still under negotiation. We have some ideas for how to move forward with that. Um, and I think that's kind of the basics of the land trade. I'm going to turn it over to Dave Whittakin now to talk about the Forest Service perspective on the land trade. And before we do that, I'll close out by saying that everything that is proposed, every action that is proposed on Mountain Accord is going through a public feedback process. We care about what you think in this room and that it requires everybody on the executive board to nod in agreement before it gets executed. Mayor Pollard is one of those executive board members. And so we've heard there's concerns with this right here. And nothing's going to move forward until Mayor Pollard, as a member of the executive board, is comfortable with how things are going to move forward. With that, I'll turn it over to Dave. Where's the laser? It's that one I'm seeing too. No, next one. Mm. Oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, thank you for inviting me up here. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you uh, about this. Uh, some perspective with the Forest Service. This is something that, that we had had some conversations with the ski areas about. Uh, we, we do manage some of the land that, that some of the base area is located on. Uh, it, it can be a headache for both sides. If the ski area wants to make changes in their buildings, if they want to change the, the structure of those kinds of things, there's an approval process to go through. I myself am not an expert on buildings. I'm not an expert on all that kind of stuff. I don't have a lot of staff who are experts on that. And so it, it takes a lot of time and effort to go through that. For us, we thought if we could uh, get out of the base area business and get back to managing the land that, that we typically manage, which are the, the uplands, that would be beneficial. As Mountain Accord moved forward, uh, the, the conversation started to develop on, well, maybe we can put these land exchanges in, into the process. And in particular, a lot of the backcountry folks were looking at the opportunity to put under uh, public management some of the areas that they like to ski. So you're looking at Flagstaff, Superior, Grizzly Gulch. Uh, for them, that would be a win. Uh, for us, that would be uh, you know, a good thing. That's an opportunity to manage some of those areas and provide a public benefit. Uh, the base areas, if we have the opportunity to get out of that, that's a good thing too. Now keep in mind, as we go through land exchanges, they're value for value. So as, as you look at the number of acres that are up there, it appears that the ski areas are getting you know, these, these big base areas, but there are large areas that are being exchanged. Before we can do a land exchange, we need to have appraisals done. And those areas need to be as close as possible value for value. There are opportunities to exchange some dollars to equalize those things, but we try to keep that, that to a minimum. We don't, we don't have money sitting around to purchase land, and I'm sure the ski areas don't have a bunch of money sitting around that they want to even that out as well. So we try to get, in, get, get those things as much as possible value for value. Now land exchanges are, are typically uh, uh, one party with another party. So in this case, while we're proposing, 
large, you know, we're, we're work looking at Snowbirds area, and then we've got some of these lands that are Snowbirds, uh, Alta the same, the base area, Grizzly Gulch, some of these areas, as, as a part of the Mountain Accord process. When we actually did do the land exchange, when we have an agreement, it would be the Forest Service with Alta Ski Lifts and the Forest Service with Snowbird, the Forest Service with Brighton and Solitude. But the package itself is being looked at through Mountain Accord. Uh, and, and I've, I've uh, told my folks and I've told other folks, we're sticking with Mountain Accord on this. We want to see this go through the public process in Mountain Accord. Uh, it, it's something that for me is valuable. I value folks' inputs, input. I value the, the input from the town of Alta on what they think the impacts of that might be. To me, that's very important uh, to, to get that. And any land exchange that we do, uh, if, if we do agree to this through Mountain Accord, then we will be going through the, the National Environmental Policy Act, a NEPA process on that. So uh, we can agree to this in Mountain Accord but we will still have to go through the NEPA process. It may be part of the, the transportation analysis. It may be separate from the transportation analysis, but it will receive NEPA analysis. I, as the forest supervisor, can't just go out, find people to exchange land with, and do it whenever I feel like it, because it's illegal, and I'll get fired, and I don't want to do that because I like my job. So those things will go through the NEPA process. There has been some discussion of potentially legislated land exchanges, and, and that can and does happen. We've been involved in those. We still go through a NEPA process on those. The decision may already be out there. If Congress says, for a supervisor, you will exchange those lands, then you know, we, we kind of know what the outcome is going to be. Nonetheless, we go through a NEPA process to look at mitigations to look at ways that we can, if, if there are going to be uh, impacts, to mitigate those impacts, to work with other folks. There's still a public input process to that whole thing. Again, the, the, the outcome may be predetermined, but we still value that input, we still value that engagement, and, and to us that is very necessary. That helps put the sideboards on the whole thing and how that would go. So uh, we're working through the Mountain Accord process and we're going to, to, to stay true to that Mountain Accord process. From my perspective with the Forest Service, what we're looking to get out of Mountain Accord is a, a better way of managing these canyons. We recognize that more people are coming up here to recreate. We recognize that we may not be able to handle uh, the, the increased visitation, the increased number of recreationists with the infrastructure that we have right now. We recognize that getting people efficiently, effectively, and safely up and down the canyons is a priority. And that's why we have signed on to this. We, our, our outcome isn't necessarily a transportation system. Our best outcome is how we're going to manage the use in the area. A transportation system is certainly a part of that. Also looking at the, the recreation infrastructure we have. What should the trailheads look like? Where should the parking be? Can we continue to just allow people to park on the side of the road? Heads are shaking. No, that's, that's not a good option. Uh, how many people can we accommodate in the canyon? Uh, we've started conversations with the recreation program at the University of Utah on perhaps looking at uh, what can we accommodate? How can we accommodate people in these areas? Uh, for me, it's, it's really a question of how do we manage these lands, which it was mentioned we don't want to kill the golden goose. Uh, for us, that's tremendously important because not only are they important for recreation, they're critically important for watershed. And what people do in these canyons, uh, for you guys it might be all right because you're just sending that stuff downstream. But the folks who are down in the valley, they're drinking whatever we do in here in these canyons. They're filtering it out. They're having to deal with it. And so all of those things enter into it. And, and these are all just a part of it. The land exchange is a part of that, of perhaps how we better manage recreation in the area. The transportation system is a part of that. The trails network is a part of that. All those things for, for us are critical, and, and that's why we're in this, and, and we're in it to the end. Whatever that end might look like, we're going to be there all the way to that point. So now I'll turn it over to Anno, who can uh, straighten out anything I may have said wrong. Hey, you need to, like, <laughs> yeah. I think you can grab the mic. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay. We need this red laser pointer. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Well, I understand how to get out of that light. Okay there. Uh, thank you very much and uh, for an opportunity to talk. And Jeff, I really liked your overview of as Laney's to kind of set the stage for this. Um, and Dave, of course, has a big picture relative to forest lands. At some point, we might like to hear from Dave about kind of the overarching management of all this uh, land and uh, how these lands, if we ever get them <coughs> traded, how they might be designated. But for my part, they uh, asked me, they gave me two questions to talk about and said I get three or four minutes. And I said, I can barely do an introduction in three or four minutes, but I'll give it my best shot. So I was asked, uh, what brought us to the table as part of the Cottonwood Negotiation Task Force? So in the Mountain Accord process, at some point we got to several issues that weren't being resolved. Ski area growth, dispersed use areas, where that should be, how many it should be, all that. Wilderness adjustments and that possible additions, land trades, and they, they sent the four ski areas from the Cottonwoods, Forest Service, Save Our Canyons, Black Diamond, Salt Lake City, sent us to get those things resolved, see if we could get those issues done. Uh, we've done a great job, I think. We're pretty close on most of them. That's one reason we were asked to go to that along with that group, so we did. <clears throat> Another thing that brought us to the table is a chance to have a say in a transportation fix for what we have in Little Cottonwood Canyon. This is the worst year ever to have this process going on because all the problems are non-existent or masked. I mean, we need some big we needed some big storms to have traffic not only couldn't get off at 215, but maybe snarling 215, and people stuck up here <clears throat> for hours on end or maybe overnight, and avalanches hitting the road. And then everybody would remember why we need a transportation fix. So we came to the table <clears throat> because, as Bill Levitt used to tell us when he got close to the end of his time, he said, come on, you guys. 40 years later and we're doing the same things we've always done. We have to make some steps. So I wish it would have snowed this year just for that, if nothing else. The, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Can you just hold the mic up? Sorry, she can't. She can't. I'm sorry. I sure. Thank How's you. that? <laughs> okay. It's strange to talk into a mic that you're not really talking to the people <laughs> you're looking at. It's a little bit of a different concept. Sorry. So, uh, and th the last thought relative to the transportation issue, they asked us what we thought should happen. I, we aren't transportation planners. We're ski area folks. We always just said, come on, we, we need a more reliable road. We need a, the avalanche hazard index number on our canyon is as high as any canyon, any, pl any road in North America. We gotta get that down to a modern, manageable level. <clears throat> Let the transportation experts figure it out realign the roads, snow sheds, another alternative. Any of those things are good with us. Another reason it brought us to the table is we wanted to follow the UTA lead. I mean, this is the most progressive step for trying to get ahead of a population growth of anything I've ever seen. I mean, we look at Colorado, we look at how they're struggling trying to get out of the hole they're in. UTA is trying to do for the mountains what they've done for the valley, and it is, it is the most progressive thing. And it's, Jeff said, everybody to a T likes that part. They see the problem coming. Population, this is gonna be a mess, so we wanted to be part of that effort. And everybody wants to follow it. I mean, we've got, in this effort, unlike anything we've ever seen here, we've got Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, Salt Lake City Water, Sandy City, Cottonwood Heights, Town of Alta, Save Our Canyons, Wasatch, Backcountry Alliance, Utah Legislature is 
putting big bucks in this. They know for quality of life for the people in the valley, these things have to, something has to happen. We've got senators and representatives in Washington saying, we can help figure these things out. We can help you do this. This is a really progressive thing, good part of uh, urban planning. This is, this is good. So we looked at it for our, in, for our ski areas, once in a lifetime opportunity. We just said, we're gonna do whatever it takes, go to every meeting, never miss one, be on every committee. And then we put dollars on the table. That's another reason <clears throat> we wanted to see how the table went. There's only a half a dozen, there's gotta be private dollars put into this to match some of this money that's put up by the government. And there's only a half a dozen businesses that I know of between the two canyons out of all the businesses that have put money into us, and we're one of them, so we wanted to follow our money. So there's my first, the first question. Second one was, what opportunities do we see coming out of the task force? Um, I think we're gonna see a defined uh, scope of what development should, is recommended to look like at Snowbird, Alta, Solitude, Brighton, and that's a big deal. That's been one of the questions and kind of tagging along with this land trade that I'll talk about in a minute. So that'll be really good. Lots of people having an opinion on that. We're gonna see some recommended wilderness adjustments and maybe some additions. You know, we want some changes relative to the transportation corridor. There's some things relative to trails down in the valley. There's maybe some wilderness additions that we can put together, that's all good. I think we're gonna see a study of human waste. I've been pushing, our company's been pushing really hard for this. I mean, this is a watershed health issue that we're talking about and growing population. We need to look at that. You know, I think we have winter pretty well under control. All of our skiers have an opportunity to use a bathroom. Summer is it's out of control. I mean, it's bubbling right up and you look at the growth. I think we have to get a grip on that. Salt Lake City and the Forest Service agree. We gotta, uh, that can't be a missed issue in this deal. The, as Dave mentioned, various people mentioned, we see this land trade potential to secure all of this south facing land above our town getting it into dispersed user hands, getting some different designation on it. Uh, that's a great possible outcome. Get it out of private hands and into Forest Service hands with whatever designation comes along. <clears throat> We've always, as part of that, we got a chance finally to secure public access from Highway 210 to the Emma Ridge. This is all private land, no public access if it's closed. I think this is a huge gain for when the Forest Service is willing to step forward and manage it and for all of us as dispersed users, that's a, that's a really big deal. This, is, this highway is landlocked to the ridge, essentially, if the private land gets closed. Uh, we have a great chance for Mountain Accord to help us come up with an alternative to using military weapons to do avalanche control over our buildings and village and on these slopes. That's been a big part of our negotiations and we're, <clears throat> we have, that's huge for us. And we all know how using these military weapons is a bit it's got a few inherent risks and uh, we got a chance to fix that. So we're excited about that. The, uh, as part of this land trade with this land up here, I think we've got huge potential to develop this really cool conservation recreation area. This is a mine reclamation potential area. I mean, you know, our whole community is a pretty good mine reclamation area. This needs it. This is a chance for us to come together with the city and the Forest Service and everybody and reclaim this land. And we can couple that up with the avalanche mitigation steps that we can 
come up with, and that's 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 legacy material there. That's that's as good as we can do. The uh, then as part of it, we would what we see coming is a chance for us to secure our base lands. Dave talked about that. Everybody's talked about the parts and pieces on that. This is the only the second time <clears throat> we've ever seen a chance for that to happen. Back in the 80s, all the lodges got to, for the reasons everybody talked about, got to purchase their, the land underneath their lodges and have that. And now we've got the chance as a community and as our ski company <clears throat> to be able to do that. We obviously see that as an outcome that we could have. Um, and that opportunity is not just for us. It's for us as part of the resort community in the town. It's for all of us to have the flexibility, like Dave was talking about, to be able to shape what we need to do. Uh, this thing really kind of got some wheels when the Forest Service started thinking about this transportation option coming into town and a train station or a bus terminal or the ton where does the tunnel come out or what might happen. I think it was just one more thing they went, oh, this is really not what we do. We, we manage forest lands and we do watershed health, but we don't figure out where bus stations should be. So that coupled with the chance to develop some dispersed recreation over here kind of got us all going in the same direction. The, a few things that are, that can happen that, uh, that need to, that we need to have the flexibility to deal with as a town and a ski area here in the base is Mountain Accord recommendations that come out of the NEPA analysis. Is there gonna be a transportation development center? Where is it? How big is it? What, how does that go? That's the kind of things the resort should figure out and do best. The town, the businesses, the ski area, we go, this is, this is where that should happen. There's some things happening relative to climate change that, you know, that's why all our problems are masked this year. We might need to do some different things here in the base area to keep us economically viable and environmentally strong and, and uh, you know, the mountain is gonna kind of be what it is, but we, as a town, we might need to do some different things here in the base. We're gonna have to do, as our company, being part of the resort, we're gonna have to try and figure out how to remain competitive. We got, we're getting, this competitive landscape is changing. Some of it might be relative to the base area, some of it might be part of summer, to be part of <clears throat> what we need to, to be a strong ski area to try and have the kind of skiing experience that we have today. I put population pressure, Jeff said it was urbanizing pressure, yeah. I, if that city gets half again as big or twice as big, the pressure on this canyon year round, summer, winter, uh, we're gonna need some flexibility as a town to figure out how to deal with it. Ask Mayor Pollard what he thinks about summer. He goes, we, we see the pressure, it's here. We gotta figure out what to do with it. And if it gets bigger, <clears throat> we, we need, I think it gives us flexibility to figure out as a resort how to deal with that. There's been concerns about what we, what we do, what we might do with this land if we get it. I don't know yet. I know all those reasons are some of the reasons we think it'd be good if we had it. Uh, I've a, I, I had a really good talk with <clears throat> Mayor Becker, and I said, "There's, you know, we don't have this all figured out yet. There's people in our town that are afraid of us getting 160 acres in the base, thinking we're going to try and turn it into some big deal." And he said, "Really?" He said, "What are you telling them?" I said, I'm telling them three things, and please help me if I'm missing something. First, I'm telling them that the Mountain Accord process, as a couple people talked about, is defining what kind of growth should happen in the mountains. They want to give their recommendation. They want 
big development to happen on the ends. They want limited development to happen in the mountains. They wanted, they've defined what, what, can ha what should happen, could happen in Snowbird, Alta, Solitude, and Brighton. That's one, that's a big deal. Everybody on that list is gonna sign off on that. Second is Salt Lake City owns the water. Salt Lake City, by my reckoning, doesn't lose very many water battles. You could ask Mark Hake, he's been <clears throat> working with them for a while. That's a big deal. Third is we've got a town here. We've got a strong town. It's well supported. We've got town ordinances, town regulations. This town figures out what they want to do. We're just one business in the town. Those are three big things. And he said, that's as good as you get for protections. And you know, some people say, yeah, what do you get the land? What if somebody, what if it changes ownerships? I think everybody needs to ask that question. I don't see our company change in ownership, but you should ask yourself that question. And if we do, those three protections are still there. That's the, that's the background. And, and anybody that owns this ski area wants to be part of a successful resort. I mean, we could, we could, run, we could run a ski area for about two years if we didn't have a successful resort to be part of what we need to make it go. I mean, we can't op operate in a vacuum. We need the lodges, we need the community, we need everything. Maybe we need some more to stay competitive as time goes on, but that's, that's what we're thinking. Um, another thing that I think we might see getting out of this, uh, coming out of the task force is, as part of the trade, we're gonna try, we'd like to get some additional snowmaking water. This year, Climate change, I go, hmm, we might have to make a little more snow than I ever thought we might need to make. We're gonna try to work with Salt Lake City Water and see if we can get some additional water out of this. Everybody wants to bring something to the table. That's, I think, a big thing for us to be successful. Um, then the, I got a whole list of things that could happen in uh, that might happen here in town that are probably good ideas, things that have been talked about, and I don't know where any of them would happen, but I think they could all happen somewhere in that 160 acres. You know, to, for a start, we're probably in that 160 acres, we're probably got 40% of it covered with existing things that we already have. Lifts, buildings, parking lots, we're already on those. <clears throat> Additionally, you know, here's a few. The trailhead, we've talked about a trailhead. Where might the trailhead be? Where do the trails go? A garbage center, recycling center, we've always talked about that. Where does that go? Somewhere in that circle. Maybe some housing, some employee housing, low income housing, where does that go? I don't know. Parking, maybe some better parking for uh, some of the housing developments, uh, the Schrantz development, they're trying to figure that out. Maybe that could happen somewhere in that 160 acres. You know, a, an example is this Crown Castle building. I mean, we got huge fiber came to our town. We got, they got to have a, a hub building. And you know, we're putting that on a piece of private ground, on our private ground because they didn't even want to figure out how they might go to the Forest Service to put the hub building and go through the process for that. And we had some private ground, we worked with the town and the county, and I think we're gonna be able to have that be successfully done. It's an example of how that goes. We got a zinc remediation project we're working on with Snowbird and the town of Alta and the Forest Service and Salt Lake City Water. <coughs> We have worked around the Forest Service land to figure out where that remediation center might be. We're talking about putting it on our piece of, piece of our private land. That's the kind of things that happen in communities. The, uh, and then there's a whole bunch of things we haven't thought of that the community will think of it as we go through all these things. And we, need, we might have the flexibility as a town to be able to figure out where to put those and make us a good, successful resort.
So there's a bunch of things coming out. We don't have them all figured out. We're gonna work with the town to put that together, make it mesh with the plans that the town has and, and get everybody's input and work with it. We, we, are, we can't operate in a vacuum we, and we don't want to. So we're gonna work with the town. So the last thing I think on the list that we hope to see come out of the task force is how to resolve Grizzly Gulch and that issue. Um, we've, for purposes of this trade, we've been talking about leaving Grizzly Gulch out and, and adding the, all the land that we have in the Emma Ridge, all the private land we have in the ski area, coupling that up with what Snowbird has. Grizzly Gulch is its own unique deal. For our ski area, two key purposes for that 250 acres up there is one, it's the only place we have to ever expand our ski area within our basin that, that we have. Uh, I'm really happy to hear Dave talk about, he didn't quite say gonna look, the U is gonna look at capacity, but he had a nicer term for it. Ultimately, we're gonna have to figure that out, but maybe in the short run or long run, we go, you know, a few more people could come up here and go ski in this ski area could be a little bigger. Nobody wants them to be a lot bigger, but all four ski areas through this process are figuring out how they should be. That's our only expansion area that we have. <clears throat> so we go, that's kind of a big deal to us. And it's our only connection to Big Cottonwood, uh, part of one Wasatch, it's, it's the place that we would connect to solitude as we've connected to, sol to Snowbird. So we're, we're saying that we're, as Laney said, we're continuing to figure out a way that we might trade that for another business opportunity. You know, today and what's in the current blueprint is a replacement connection to Big Cottonwood, which is a tunnel for, <clears throat> that's in there. So we go, okay, if we, nobody wants us to connect on the ridge and we get a tunnel and we get to connect uh, through by a ski train, eh, that's pretty cool. We'd probably go for that. Salt Lake City Water and the task force has said they recognize that we'd be giving up a business opportunity and, they, and in discussions today we're talking about They've put additional water and some sort of cumulative Salt Lake City water, town of Alta blessing that might have to come that if that tunnel came, we might be able to develop the Transit Development Center. And for purposes of discussion today, they have they've said that would come with some additional water because the town pretty much has their water figured out for the developments with the existing town and it's the development <clears throat> water is a hunt for a hundred unit hotel and eight shops. I mean, that's just what they're talking about today. They said that fits the scope of Mountain Accord, limited development in the mountains, gives some sort of enough energy to a <clears throat> transit center that it might be good. I bet I'm over my three or four minutes away. Meg's going like this and she's getting kind of antsy. So um, we're uh, going to continue trying to figure that out because that's a, that's a big deal. There's a community that doesn't want a, a lift to the ridge. And if today this was all done, we'd have a deal because we'd say, okay, we've got a train in a tunnel. <clears throat> we're going to do the center. We'll give you Grizzly Gulch. We'll take all this other stuff and do the trade. The, the, the nagging question out there with the communities that is what happens if Mountain Accord implodes and nothing happens and the land trade goes and Alta still has Grizzly Gulch? It's an unresolved question. We're going to work on trying to resolve that, but there's a timing issue there. So. Okay, before Meg comes and takes this away from me. No, just three minutes, perfect. No, thank you. So now we've had the, uh, the overview and the perspective and now we're gonna turn it over to the mayor and then Chris from Alta's perspective. S no. 
So as, as we've heard everybody talk about, uh, I think what, what is the, the, the issue that brought us here today, which is, is the land exchange. Um, you know, I, I sit here, and, and actually I have my notes here, and they go like this around the corner on both sides and inside and out. And, and I see many perspectives of, of the big picture of this is, as to how, you know, how the, the region can, can benefit, how Alta can be benefit. I mean, I see the benefit of land designations, the better benefit of, of, of forest management and town managers, management of the area. The, the benefits for public access, avalanche control. But I think that the, the unresolved question is how is that the possibility of the land exchange going to affect the, the town as it exists today? How does, that, how does the vision of what Alta wants to see it, the, see it become in the next few years come to be? And, and, I, and, it's, I mean, and that's really why we're here today. I mean, this, this whole process and education uh, uh, session that we're going to be going through over the next uh, two or three weeks is to really try to help us get our hands around th what the vision of Alta is and what, what we want Alta to look at in the future and to really get a definition of, of what the, d the vision is. is because personally, as, as I have gone through this process for the last year and a half, I was going along and, and I've been a big supporter of the whole process. And then as this blueprint process came, came out, uh, I started getting beat up pretty bad for some of the, the, I don't know, the items that I have supported going forward. And, and I all of a sudden started going, wow, did I, miss, did I miss the point? But I go back and read the vision statements and I look at some of the information I've seen over, over the years from, from other exercises we've done. And I don't feel like I have, but I think that, that this process has, has brought up a lot of questions that need to be answered, and that's what we're gonna be doing here in the next little bit. You know, I mean, I, I mean you know, I, like I say, I, I, I have questions on this whole process too. I mean, you know, and, and I think that you know, as, as I would say that the thing that I've heard more than anything is, is nobody wants to see Alta turn into Vail. And uh, that's, that's a huge concern here. Um, but as, the, as, as everybody said through here, through the Mountain Accord process, one of the definitions or one of the, the guiding principles has been limited development at the base area of, of the ski areas. And, uh, but on the other hand, you know, it, there's also the notion that, that as part of the transportation and trying to make everything work, they're going to try to direct more people to the base area of the ski areas because they have the infrastructure that can support the environmental protection. Whether I mean, you know, whether it's bathrooms in the summertime, whether it's whether it's parking, whether it's uh, restaurant facilities, or, or whether it's it's the start of trailheads. So there's a lot of questions that that need to be answered here, and and I think that there's there's a lot of fear from the community here that. Uh, that, that things will change to the point where all of the things that we've loved about Alta for the years may, may go away. Um, there is also a big, uh, big concern among the, um, the existing businesses in the town of Alta that have supported this, this town for you know, 60, 60 plus years. And you know, what, what is the impact of, of what today is 17 acres of private land in the base of the Alta area being, you know, and, and now all of a sudden one, one particular business now owns 160 acres. I mean, you know, you look at the dimensions there, I mean, that, that changes the game dramatically. And throughout the process, everybody has said, you know, that, that this is really the opportunity for Alta because Alta has all, the town of Alta, because they have the control, whether it's water, and it's zoning, and and that that is the that is the the, the core core the, of the control that we have here. But you know, there's you know sometimes uh, there's a little question as to is that really strong enough? And so you know, I, I I've been wrestling with the water issue over the last couple of weeks, and and the fact that maybe we don't need any more water in in the in Alta to try to 
uh, accommodate some of the some of the possibilities that we we can have going going forward. And but on the other hand, you know, as as Anna would say, I mean, over the years there's been a lot of things that we've wanted in the town of Alta. Is it a community center? Is it more housing? I mean, is it a separate building for a school and and uh, you know the nonprofits and and built and things like that? You know, if if we are I'm going to support a transit sol solution up here. We need to have a landing spot for people to be able to put, you know, if they're going to come up on a train, they're going to have their stuff. They're going to need to, there's going to need to be a public facility that people can put their things in so that they can enjoy their day up here. I mean, there's so many things that, that could come out of it, but I think that we need to figure out as a, as a community and a group, how do we balance the, the possibilities that we can have for enhancement and still maintain what we have here. Because it, it, there's another group of people that would uh, just assume that nothing happened up here. But, but it's, a, I mean, it's a huge question and, and, and really that is why we're here today and, and trying to go through this effort that we're gonna do for the next, you know, ho hopefully we can, we can get a framework done in the next six months but, but, but that's going to be a, a, hu a huge task, and we need everybody's input on this. So I think with that, I'll, uh, I'll uh, you, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's, a, you know it's, it's a controversial issue. And I think that the one thing that I think we need to realize is that, and, and hope we can do this, and I think, you know, Dave, uh, Dave from the Forest Service uh, touched on this, is that we need to make sure that this is not a bunch of little piecemeal things coming together. It's, it's one big decision that, that makes everything happen as a whole unit. And as, as uh, I think, I can't I think it was Laney said at a meeting I was at last night, or no, I think it was uh, Andy from uh, Park City said, you know, some of this was, in, was initiated by the fact that, oh, well, there was, there was uh, Ski Link, and then there was this, and then there was that. And, you know, if that would have piecemealed happened throughout the whole Wasatch region, you know, probably a few years later, everybody looked at it and go, God, well, we did all of this, but if we would have just done this and this, it would have worked better and, and been a much better plan. So that's what, the, that's what the advantage of this is going forward, and I'll, leave, I'll go to Chris now and let him talk about some of the planning measures we go forward. Thank you, Mayor. Chris Colley with the Town of Alta. I think I know everybody here. Um, and I'm going to be pretty brief here. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, cover the entirety of topic number two in about five minutes. Um, this is merely going to be an introduction of um, where we stand currently um, in terms of our municipal general plan uh, here in the town of Alta, um, how we got there in the recent past, and uh, where we can expect to go in the very near future. Um, Utah State Code Title 10, Chapter 9, LUDMA, the Land Use and Development Management Act, um, is slightly longer than the blueprint, um, but uh, that sort of uh, states and sets forth uh, law here in the state of Utah um, guiding development and land use at the municipal level. Um, and it states very generally that um, the Planning Commission or Land Use Authority for a municipality will create a general plan for land use development and other factors um, within that municipality. And the way that uh, it moves out of the Planning Commission is that uh, we have public meetings, they have an official public hearing, uh, it's kicked up to the town council, um, which can do uh, a number of things with it, such as adopt it, amend it, remand it, uh, not adopt it. Um, and, uh, you know, the way that it works practically and, and what has to happen uh, following adoption of a general plan or revision of a general plan um, is that, of course, we develop local land use and zoning code around the plan. Um, you know, basically the plan is the foundation, um, zoning and uh, other land use restrictions uh, in our local town code uh, are really what determine what can happen on the ground here. And I know that this is all rudimentary to, to most of you here. Um, you know, currently our general plan is 10 years old, um, although uh, to take a, a thorough reading of it, um, it really, it, it acknowledges um, nearly all of what we are talking about in Mountain Accord currently. Um, it acknowledges 
um, the possibility that transit could one day uh, exist in the canyon. It acknowledges the need to work with ski areas and local businesses um, on subjects uh, like ski area expansion. It, um, it makes really strong statements um, about places in town and places up here in Little Cottonwood Canyon um, where we don't want to see development um, that we need to see protected. Um, I'm sure many of you in the room were here for uh, our most recent general plan work. In 2011, we began our most recent general plan update um, that produced a vision statement, which the mayor referred to, which we have copies of over on the table, um, and, it, and it produced uh, an enhancement of section 4.3, which is the commercial element. And the commercial element um, is uh, kind of the mo ro most robust portion of the 2005 plan. Um, it states known conditions, um, policy goals, and action items um, for uh, managing commercial activity in the base area. And it also, um, very importantly, identifies the commercial core of the town of Alta as the place where we want to see commercial use um, focused. Um, and then, of course, recently in December, um, uh, we adopted uh, an amendment to our base facility zone ordinance, which was a, a long struggle that, um, again, most of you were involved in. But um, that uh, sort of acknowledges that and is built on um, elements in the vision statement and the commercial element of the general plan. Um, and what that uh, has done is allow existing commercial properties um, to expand their footprints um, and to make significant renovations uh, to their properties. Um, you know, those processes were built on what's really a catalog of studies and public input processes that, again, many of you here in the room um, were, were a part of. Um, I'm sure um, most of you remember, remember these. Um, we had a great uh, study uh, in 2003, sort of a SWOT analysis of our uh, local economy and local marketplace um, that sort of came on the heels of a couple of down years in business up here in the town of Alta. Um, I know I was present for a presentation by uh, Miles Rademan, a planner and facilitator, um, on the subject of rethinking Alta. This was a broad overview of what it what it takes for a community and a place to, to imagine its future and identify its values. Um, you know, what, what are the five or six things that define a place uh, and, and how do you uh, organize your local policy around those themes? Um, in 2011, I believe in the late summer and early fall, there was a summer economic development roundtable um, that again, most of you were present for. Um, and this kind of built some framework strategies for how we could um, enhance summer business um, with what we have on the ground currently. And it makes re recommendations uh, sort of beyond the immediate future for, for how summer business could, uh, could look in the town of Alta. What would we offer? Who would offer it? Um, is our current infrastructure sufficient? Um, or, or do we, or would we want to think about some changes in the way the town of Alta is laid out? Um, and of course, uh, you know, these things take a lot of time. Um, uh, the general plan update took uh, almost three years to be adopted. Um, and of course, the base facility zone ordinance amendment took longer than that. Um, and it takes commitment from the community. Um, and one of the things uh, that, as you know, as you all know, uh, you know, it's a defining feature of this community is that um, currently it's seasonal. Uh, we're here for six or seven months, and then um, a lot of us are here intermittently, intermittently and not at all. And, and something that I want to um, uh, make sure that we're all clear about is that the stuff we're talking about today is um, really required attendance material for people who care about where people care about Alta, um, local businesses, people who depend on the place. So, um, you know, basically uh, the, the vision statement, the, um, the commercial element, section 43 in the general plan, uh, the update to that, and the base facility zone amendment um, were really uh, foundational to, um, to what we need to do going forward here um, as the blueprint 
um, sort of gets uh, melded into something that's adoptable by all the jurisdictions um, at the table in Mountain Accord. Um, and we need to do that for, for our own local reasons. We need to think about um, economic sustainability of the ski area and local businesses um, and, and how to, how to um, facilitate the higher use that, use that we know is coming without impacting our um, natural uh, resources. Um, we are going to embark on a significant general plan update most likely in the late summer um, or early fall. Uh, we anticipate that this uh, will be focused on the commercial core, which as I described is essentially the base area, the ski area between the parking lots. Um, we want to just sort of talk about some, some uh, big picture visioning items um, for the commercial core in particular. Um, we want to develop a better sense of what it would take um, to supplement our current marketplace with opportunities to perhaps make our, um, our market more viable year round. Um, we want to think about how our town is laid out and um, enhance pedestrian connectivity uh, here in the town of Alta. Um, we want to see if we can strategize uh, how to create a sense of entry um, into the heart of town here. Um, and of course, we want to do all of that within, um, uh, you know, within the promise of uh, respecting and promoting our natural resources. Uh, and, and the sense of community that, um, as the mayor described, is really what, what keeps us here. You know, we all know that we come for the skiing and we stay for, for each other. And um, so, uh, you know, we also need to be um, uh, thinking about how this, um, how this general plan update could inform um, future land use ordinances here in the town of Alta. Um, that's a, you know, that's a, a pretty big project. Um, and we need to be thinking about um, transit. Um, what if transit um, arrives here in Alta uh, and Little Cottonwood Canyon? Um, and and uh, mode alignment, um, termini uh, are all really big variables that we need to be strategic in, in how we plan for. Um, we have uh, over here, of course, um, a timeline of events related to, to Mountain Accord. Um, we have um, sort of a broad blue um, polygon here meant to illustrate that um, this is the beginning of um, a public process for us. Um, please, uh, please sign up at the front door. Um, I'm going to be communicating with folks who sign up um, and leave me an email address. Um, we have created kind of a social media platform for, for engaging you on these subjects today. Um, and we're going to be firing that up a little bit more uh, robustly as we move into our next round of meetings in two weeks. Um, and I will get you information about that. But basically, we've, we've um, signed up for an account on a website called mysidewalk.com. Um, check it out uh, on the internet. Um, and look for Alta Utah. And it's just sort of a platform for conversation. Um, and it's a place where we can make documents available and provide links to other information. Um, please take handouts that are over here in the table. These are mostly about um, local issues here in Alta. Um, it's a fair amount of reading, but it's really important um, that we all understand our current policy, um, that we understand how various elements of Mountain Accord um, fit in with that policy. And I just, um, I want to leave you with um, a couple questions. Um, the first of which is what are the five or six things that are um, fundamental to this place that we can't do without? Um, not so much what brought you here, but what has kept you here. Um, and um, the other thing to think about is um, some of the goals, some of the vision statement and goals material um, we have in the handouts over here. Um, read it and take it seriously and um, think about Mount Accord. Think about... Um, whether that could 
provide us the tools to achieve some of the goals we've set forth in those documents. Um, so that's my piece. Well, thank you. You've all been really patient and listening a lot. So again, Chris kind of, you know, again, tonight the goal was giving the information that the town knows, right? So you've had a lot of information uh, you may already have heard it, but we're, that's the mission. And again, on Thursday night, the exact same thing. Uh, the same presentation, same information. But then it shifts to you. So what can you do? That, how can you give that public input? Well, Chris talked about the social media, old-fashioned comment cards, old-fashioned talking to the mayor and your council members and planning commission members that are here. Yeah, got to be brave. There you go, right? Because the Planning Commission is going to be the one to pick up this general plan and, and ask all these big questions and get your input. So the other thing the mayor had mentioned, we're kind of trying to get within the next month from folks that are in town, the in-person input, and that's sort of the goal, but it's ongoing. It's going to continue, and there's lots of ways for you to give that input. And so the one thing I would say is for those meetings next week, or not next week, to get a break next week, and then we hope that you come back either on the 14th or the 16th, right here, 5.30 um, to 7.30, and it's gonna be a place where really those conversations can happen and that information and your questions, your comments, your concerns, your thoughts. The, I think the great thing Chris put together here was looking at the Alta's plan and the blueprint plan. And wh where are their connections? Where aren't there? What does ALTA want to put in that plan? And that's what the planning commissioners are going to be starting and wrestling with, and that's where the input is. So we've, you've been sitting for a long time. You're probably <laughs> ready to stretch, but we do have some folks here. We have a few more minutes, so if there are a couple of questions you'd like to ask of what we've focused on today, so again, that vision for Mountain Accord, the vision for ALTA, and then some discrete parts. If there are questions that you had on this presentation or that framework, uh, we can take those now. I'm gonna have to do a Carol Merrill and give you the mic. You may not know that reference, any of you under 30, but I will be handing the mic around so that we can get this on video. That's another thing, let your neighbors know. We'll post this. Chris, you can talk about the details, but anyone who wants to watch this again, again, the, the town's mission is to try to get this information out to get the input back from you. So um, we have a few minutes, and Mayor and I think you guys stayed around, Dave and Lonnie and Jeff and Ona. Um, so are there questions that I can entertain? And we'll try to get you an answer for tonight. Sorry, I know it doesn't amplify, but it takes That's okay. So if I heard correctly, I believe that part of the land exchange uh, for the ski resort, Ono, was a mention of 100 units in your uh, 140 acres. And I'm wondering what the definition of a unit is. Is that one bedroom, one bathroom that sleeps two people? Is that one home? Is that, and what's a unit? And then would you then be able to distribute those units to the existing lodges or is Alta's plan to build a 100 unit hotel? Okay, and uh, I'm just gonna, sorry we have to do this, but uh, a very discreet question, there you go. First, there's two kinds of water in this issue. The snowmaking water that we have been talking about with the land trade. <clears throat> Taking the Emma Ridge and the Snowbird and all the land trade that comes together, we're gonna try and get some snowmaking water out of that. And th then, the other water issue is that if there's ever a transit option or something that would get us to trade Grizzly Gulch for a tunnel to Big Cottonwood, the, the offer is that possibly there'd be some additional water and support for a transit development center that we could <clears throat> run. And it's been as simple as saying, um, water for 100 units. That for purposes, for my understanding, it's like we could build a 100 unit hotel if there was ever a transit option here and a connection to Big Cottonwood in a whole different picture. If just the land trade as we have it now doesn't have anything to do with that water, 
That's all tied to Grizzly Gulch and a transit alternative. So you're not looking at this. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Anna. So you're... The, the resort's purpose is not to build a 100-unit hotel. You just use that as a, as a trading base. You're not, you're not sitting here saying, hey, we want to build a, a 100 hotel. So when I think about a unit, I think, are you thinking about the Cliff Lodge where you have these two-bedroom condominium units that, so you're, you're, you're open to the definition of unit, and the town council hasn't defined what a, what a unit is, or the planning commission hasn't defined what a unit is? No, I, you know, this all came up. Like a, a month ago, in the last six weeks or eight weeks, and Salt Lake City came up with that notion, put it on the table, said, enough water for 100 units and eight shops, and you ought to be able to develop a transit center. And we went, oh, well, I guess at least somebody is coming up with an alternative to, to talk to us about giving up our business opportunity in Grizzly Gulch, and that's what everybody's attempting to do. It hasn't been fleshed out at all by my reckoning. Great, um, does that get to it? I mean, and, and I don't know if you want Chris to speak to it from the town's role, it's a regulatory that will, that will come into it. So, okay, great, thanks. Another question. Um, I, I just wonder what the, uh, it might be useful to say what the current zoning in that area is today. Um, I think that might help address your concern. And then I had a question for Dave, wherever, there you are. Um, did I, is it a fair understanding of what you said to, uh, to conclude that a legislative, a legislated land trade is off the table until Mountain Accord runs its course? Okay, so let's, two questions. Let's have the mayor answer the first one about the zoning and then so the current zoning in the land that, that would be exchanged is FR50, which is one, one house per 50 acres. So, so right now the, the value of that land is, you know, whatever, three, three houses for, <laughs> on that land. So our intention is to, to work through the Mountain Accord process. If Congress decides to take something up, they do what they want on stuff. I, my suspicion in working with the, the staffers and the members of the delegation is they're not going to carry anything into legislation unless they know they have pretty broad support from the community, from the folks who are working on Mountain Accord. I think that they, they got a little bit stung on the whole... Uh, uh, ski link thing and so they're pretty much saying until we know that this is something that we're not going to get raked over the coals on we're not going to advance it so i'd be surprised if they moved it forward they can do what they want uh, we're not going to be pushing on it and i'm pretty sure that the ski areas are not going to push on something like this i can't speak for them until they think that it has a reasonable chance of success and, and I think if, if they knew there was going to be a, a great outcry on something like that, I don't think they'd push it forward either. But only Anno could really answer that part of it. Does that answer your question, sir, for now? <laughs> uh, for the forest service, okay. Sorry. A couple of questions for uh, David Whittakind. Um Could you please tell us more um, about what the conversations have been with the Utah congressional delegation and their staffers about, um, particularly about the Alta land trade. That would be my first question. And the second question is, um, what is the consideration on the part of the Forest Service of putting, you know, since this land currently belongs to the American people, um, this beautiful, special place, that belongs to the American people. What's the consideration for uh, protecting it now while it does belong to the American people and putting in conservation easements and um, deed restrictions in the event that there were to be a, a, a land exchange? 
So on the, on the first question, I, I have not spent a lot of time talking specifically with the delegation on, on the land trades. They, they have been on the periphery of a lot of this stuff as far as the Cottonwood Canyons negotiation. They're, they're more waiting to hear what the outcomes are. So they're, they're not in the middle of it. They, I think they're waiting to see if, if we reach an agreement, if we reach a, a consensus, an accord, as it were. Uh, if, if we get to that point, then I think that's when they'll pick it up. Uh, the conversations about uh, federal designations, uh, we've got a, a couple of staffers who are in that, which is talking about uh, potential designation uh, uh, wilderness areas, a potential larger designation for greater protection, such as uh, a national monument, a national conservation area, a national recreation area. They're, they're in those discussions. Uh, they, they haven't expressed a lot of opinions one way or another uh, on, you know, yes, wilderness or no wilderness. A lot of these uh, potential wilderness uh, areas have been negotiated in the past under Representative Matheson. Uh, that, that bill didn't get a lot of traction, but I think that the delegation is engaged to the point that if we do get a broad consensus, uh, the delegation, I believe, will be willing to carry, carry something forward. And, and all of the members of the delegation, all the representatives and the two senators, have at least had, or they have some knowledge on this whole thing. So they're not, uh, I, I, I would hope that if we get all of the members on board, that's the best chance of passing something. If, if a state delegation is divided, then we're not going to see anything pass. Dave, I, I don't think I asked my question very well. Um, uh, uh, my, my second question um, is uh, I'm talking about the suggested um, land exchange for the um, Alta uh, base zone, the 100 to 160 acres that we've been talking about. So my question is, um, you know, to my way of thinking, um, the top of Little Cottonwood Canyon is a special place on the order of Zion Canyon, Yosemite Valley, and, it, and it's currently owned by the American people. And so if the Forest Service were to exchange away that land, um, what is the consideration for um, taking the opportunity now, while it's owned by the American people, to uh, provide for deed restrictions and conservation easements to, so, that, so that the American people now have the maximum um, um, input and say uh, going forward into how this land is going to be used. So uh, on the, the, the land exchanges, can we bring up the maps? On, on the land exchange, particularly in the Cottonwood Canyons. Uh, as we're looking at these areas, the, the areas that we would be looking to acquire are the higher lands. The areas that we would be potentially uh, exchanging are the, the, the base areas, the areas that have already been developed. My question, David, is about the base area land. Sure. So uh, the Forest Service really has very limited authority to hold conservation easements or, or put deed restrictions on. Uh, we don't, we're not given that authority by law. So as we exchange out of things, uh, I can't put restrictions on it because I don't have that authority. Congress has not given me, the forest supervisor, the authority to put restrictions when we do a land exchange. So I can't add, any, add anything to it. The same goes for the land that we would uh, potentially acquire. If Alta already had deed restrictions on it, if they had conservation easements, we would not be interested in that land. Uh, to, to put it in, in uh, the, the attorney's uh, language, they talk about the bundle of rights with, with a, a piece of land. We want the whole bundle. So the federal government does not like owning split estate. We would want all the minerals. We would want all of, all of everything that goes with it. And, and same, when we exchange out of it, that's part of that value. Uh, so if, if there were to be any sort of uh, conservation easements uh, on that land, it would, it would need to take place after it was exchanged. Alta could work with any, any number of 
of conservation easement organizations to do that, but I as the forest supervisor do not have the authority to put any sort of deed restrictions or conservation easements on it. I can't hold those as a forest supervisor.